Friday. It is uh, Friday the 21st, and I don't know about you, but this week was, um, it was a lot of fun. So, welcome to Q&A Friday. My name is Thomas Dimitrovich, and um, every Friday I try, and next Friday I won't be able to uh, do a Q&A Friday because I will be in a meeting. I believe in South Dakota, so I'm not sure. I can't remember where. But in any case, I will be in a meeting. And I won't be able to do a, a Q&A Friday next, next week. So, today is it. I've got uh, one item I do want to make sure I cover, and it's related to separately derived systems. Had a question come in uh, with regard to separately derived systems. And generators and transfer switches when to use a three pole transfer switch when do i need a four pole transfer switch and what are the what are some of the concerns that you might have outside of um you know some of the performance for the power distribution system so we're going to cover those as well so uh but first but first Got a couple items from JW. Now, one of his questions, the first question he has is on 70B. Now, I will tell you that I, uh, I will tell you that 70B, 70 Bravo is in the review process. So what's happening on 70B is that we're moving it from a recommended practice, I think it is. To a standard, um, that activity is. I think uh, it, it, it's it's very time consuming. The the committee is working very diligently on trying to bring that document to the marketplace. Eli, happy Friday! Happy happy Friday! Um, oh, I got my wrong pen. This is not my thinking pen. This is my Keith Laughlin thinking pen. So I've got this, uh, Eli. I've got to put uh, I got to put that one away. That's that's not the thinking pen. So <clears throat> so we we're talking seventy B, and I'm I'm working on a seventy B educational program because seventy B is moving to a standard. And J W says he struggles to understand how, for other than proponents of sales for the NFPA seventy B standard. It's significant at all that should is replaced with shall. So he's asking for the significance. Why is it significant that we replace the shoulds with shalls? Gustavo Chavez, welcome and and uh, working now. Happy Friday, brother. We'll see you later. Thanks for stopping in. You can always leave comments down below. Uh, so please leave comments down below, questions, uh, you know, your thoughts about today's Q&A Friday. The first point of discussion is NFPA 70B, as in Bravo. And JW is like, what, what does it matter? Why go from shoulds to shells? Well, and I have to apologize right off the bat because I'm having an allergy attack right now. Uh, I don't know what I stirred up. I think I stirred up some dust when I was over there, and uh, my nose, I might be sniffling, and it's because of allergies here. So in any case, he says, uh, something nowadays can be done by a simple find and change in the software program. Okay, Elizabeth. <laughs> Bless his heart. <laughs> Bless his heart. And you know what, though? He said that to me when he gave me this pen. So I don't know. I don't know. You know, what's really funny is um, I was with my wife. We were, I think it was at the Southern section. I can't remember what meeting it was in, but um, <laughs> uh, they made a statement. Somebody made a statement. Somebody was doing something on stage and was screwing up and, and, um, it wasn't it, it it wasn't it wasn't an IEI meeting. I can't remember which meeting it was, but there was a gentleman and it wasn't Keith Laughlin, somebody else from Texas or K 
Carolinas or whatever. And they said, uh, bless his heart. And my wife looked at me and thought, she goes, well, that was nice. And I said, well, I don't think that they meant that in a nice, in a nice way. Uh, bless his heart can be taken uh, a few different ways. All right. To sell. Welcome aboard. And hello. Oh, my. My nose. My nose. I just made a statement that my, my nose is, uh, is I'm having an allergy attack. So, Diego, just bear with me. Sorry about that. So, in any case, understanding, replacing the word should with shall. So, 70B is looking at the entire document and saying, look, we want to move it to a standard. So, we're going to make... We're going to make a lot of these uh, these statements instead of a you should do this, you shall do this. And, and, and here's why, JW, you just don't want to go through the entire document and just replace the word should with shall. There are probably a lot of things you should do or you could do, but to actually make it a requirement means a lot. It's significant. So I could say, you know, you know, you really should um, you really should check the air in your tires before you go out driving every time. And that's one thing that when I say you should do that, you could use your judgment to say, you know, I'm not going to do it this time. I'm going to do it next time. But when I say you shall check the air in your tires every time you leave that vehicle, I don't leave any opportunity for you to say look i got in the vehicle this morning and checked my air and my tires before i left i came back went in the house because i forgot my keys and i went right back out and now i gotta check my air again in my tires i just checked them five minutes ago the way the language could read is you should check them before you you leave the garage and 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 this is the second time in five minutes so do i really need to check my air so they, it, you, and that's a stupid, <laughs> stupid relationship. But in any case, we're looking at every single statement with the eyes of we're moving this to a you shall, which is significant. So there are some things maybe you you could do or you should do, possibly. But there are things that you must do. That's what we're honing in on. Uh oh, Mark Rogers. Always those on the flies. Question on UL 508A SB4. How would the SCCR rating be applicable to the electronically SCR switched capacitor system with reactors connected in parallel to a network be applicable? And do you want that answer based upon a third or a fourth order differential equation? I'm not sure. So let me know if you want it on a third order differential or a fourth order differential. Excuse me. My nose is running, so apologize. We're going to get to that one. I just want to answer JW first. So his his first question on 70B is it's we're we're moving to a shell and we just can't do a, a, a search or replace. He says a jurisdiction can simply decide if it were to adopt 70B how it chooses to interpret short or shell however it pleases. Remember, when you leave when you leave it to the inspector to interpret how they want to employ shorter shell, you're putting that inspector in a difficult position because now it's almost like it's personal, right? It's I want to I'm going to do a I'm going to do a shell. I'm going to I'm going to interpret this as a shell for JW, you know, because you know JW, man, I you know I don't know about that guy, but but um, but Mark Rogers, you know. I'm going to I'm going to do that as it should. You know, ah, I'm going to give him some forgiveness. The four would be sufficient. Fourth order differential. Okay. So you want it to be consistent. You want the inspectors to all enforce it the same way, so you don't want to bring that um ability to what do they call that? Subjective? You don't want it to be subjective. I think it's subjective. Anyway, I never use those words right. Anyway, as long as it's a feeder conduct. Oh, uh, so what about what about what they are putting in for marinas? 
If 70B is the maintenance standard, why have special rules for marinas? It gives folks the idea that they are only legally expected to maintain certain systems. Why is the internal politics of the committees of NFPA 70 versus 70B, NEC Article 231 deb debacle, becoming something non-political people have to deal with? All right, so... Boy, JW, you got some really good statements there. So uh, his question about marinas, what we're doing, uh, here's a requirement in the, um, I should have read that one before. Remember, this is what I do. I push this button to go live, and that's when I think about what I'm going to be talking about. So guys like Mark Rogers and JW guide our discussion. So. I, I, that's just the way it is. Let's take a look at, you know what I'm going to do? <sighs> 2020 code book. He mentioned article 555. Ooh, news break. Guess what? News break. News break. News flash. Look at this. I found my glasses. I've lost these things for five days. I could not find these glasses five whole days. News flash, I found them. You know where I found them? <laughs> Working in the other room. I, uh, I installed a TV up on uh, the wall, and I needed to get an internet connection to it. So I put the TV up there, and I'm pulling the wire over my um, communication wire. So I had to get a ladder, and I was routing it through my rafters, through the ceiling, I got a ladder, I got up on the ladder, and I had, you know what, I, I used these glasses, these here, I used these to find things like the house, the car. I used these to read things or find things like a needle or whatever. So in any case, I needed these and not those. So what I do, I took those off, and you know where I put them? on top of my ductwork. So they've been sitting up on top of the ductwork. And you know how I found them? I had a problem with my internet and I needed to figure out which wire it was. I got up on the ladder, there she blows, Cupcake Island. So I found my glasses and I know all of you were out there worried because I lost my glasses and you were thinking about, gosh, I hope Tom finds his glasses because he needs to find the car. And it's not in this version of, of the marinas. So JW is obviously following my 2023 co-change doc, uh, document. So, so there is a new requirement, and I'm going to call it up over here. There's a new requirement that they're looking at in marinas. There, yeah, no, here it is. Replacement electrical connection shall be low. No, that's 12 inches. That's not it. Ratings, bonding. All right, so let's look at 555. 555 is looking at, and I believe it passed. So you got your load calculations, you got your transformers, bonding. Replacement of equipment, 555.15. 555.15 is new. So the 2023 code is looking at uh, adding language, replacement of equipment. When modifications or replacements of electrical enclosures, devices, or wiring methods are necessary on a docking facility, they shall be required to comply with the requirements of this code. And the installation shall require an inspection of the circuit. Existing equipment that has been damaged shall be identified, documented, and repaired by a qualified person to the minimum requirements of the addition of this code to which it was originally installed. So JW is saying, JW says, look, he says, 
What about what they're putting in for marinas? If 70B is the maintenance standard, why have special rules for marinas? And that's part of the special rules. And I would say there's also maintenance requirements in Article 700. Hey, no worries, Nihad. Thanks for joining. So, so here's the thing. This book, this book right here, the National Electrical Code, is adopted and enforced by, at the state. It's adopted into law, basically, by the legislature in most states or most jurisdictions. So they adopt this. It has to be enforced. 70B is not a document that's enforced. Or I'll say it could be enforced, like 70E for safe work practices. There's no requirement that if, and that an inspector comes to your facility and inspects your facility against 70E for safe work practices. Do you know who does that? OSHA. Typically, they come in after the fact. I think they're getting a little bit, a little bit better on being on uh, doing things uh, uh, before an event occurs. But I I would guarantee that if somebody gets killed in your facility, OSHA is going to come in and they're going to look at your safe work practices look at your safety plan, and possible fines will result. So the National Electrical Code is actually enforced by an inspector. Now you have to ask the question, is it appropriate? The other, and the other area is in Article 110. They're adding requirements in 110. I believe it's 110. Or hold on, I don't want to speak out of tune. No, I can always speak out of tune, but I don't want to be out of place. Service and maintenance of equipment, 110.17 in the 2023 National Electrical Code. Servicing and electrical preventive maintenance shall be performed by qualified persons trained in servicing and maintain maintenance of equipment and shall comply with the following, and they've got a bunch of little things in there. So why would that, why is it important that that goes in the National Electrical Code is because the National Electrical Code is adopted into law into jurisdictions. And what that could do is pull in the requirements of 70B. I call them hooks. Now, the question is whether or not it's appropriate. There's, there are those that say, look, maintenance should not be a part of the National Electrical Code. It is an installation requirement. It's not a maintenance requirement. To a, to a degree, I agree with that. To an extent, I agree with that. But there's also an understanding that maintenance is a critical part of the installation as well. So as is reconditioned equipment and all the other little things that we have. So I think that, that the hooks need to be in place to tie in documents like 70B and maintenance. Otherwise, it doesn't get addressed. 70B is not adopted and not enforced by uh, just like 70E. So JW, that's why. Um, he also has a statement, I think more than a question before I get to Mark. 5.30, at 5.30 on my Q&A Friday, and it might have been last week, I don't know, discussing the receptacle fed by other than the panel board in the room. It is located in which is derived from 210.63. There's no rule saying you can't meet the requirement by adding two number 12 wires for the receptacle in your large conduit with the feeders that supply the panel board. That supply the panel board. As long as it's feeder conductors and not service conductors supplying the panel board and as long as you meet the okay what he's talking about i get it now all right so there is a requirement in um article 210 nihad, nihad you know all about this in 210 there's a requirement that no not in 210 yes in 210 210 there's a requirement that um there's a re receptacle requirement for when for those who are servicing equipment, right? Right. It is uh, section number two ten sixty three. 
Yes, 21063. Equipment requiring servicing. Uh, a 125 volt single phase 15 or 20 amp your receptacle outlet shall be installed at an accessible location within 25 feet of the equipment as specified specified as specified in 21063 a and b a is your hvac equipment b is other electrical equipment now in b it says in other than one and two family dwellings a receptacle outlet shall be located as specified in 21063 b1 and B2, it has serv indoor service equipment, indoor equipment requiring dedicated equipment spaces. Where equipment other than service equipment requires dedicated equipment space, as specified in 110.26e, the required receptacle outlet shall be located within the same room or area as the electrical equipment and shall not be connected to the load side of the equipment's branch circuit disconnecting means. So the equipment, now it says branch circuit disconnecting means. Now what happens if the equipment I'm talking about is a panel board? And let's say it's the first panel board in an outbuilding of some sort. For me to, if I have a required receptacle outlet for that panel board, then I would have to and I can't feed it from the same. And, and what we did in the 2023 cycle, we're trying to address this language. And it, it is, um, I'm going to look at the language that we did. Excuse me for the Kleenex. My um, nose is running like a faucet because I have an allergy attack going on. 21063. Here's what we said. We said... Where equipment other than service equipment requires dedicated equipment space as specified in the required receptacle outlet shall be located within the same room or area as the electrical equipment and shall not be connected to the load side of the equipment's disconnecting means. Now, what that did, we took branch circuit out. Why did we do that? Because what if it's a feeder? If it's a panel board that needs to have a receptacle. It, it, it needs a receptacle, but I can't feed it from the panel board that I'm going to have to de-energize because I'm going to need that receptacle. So what JW is saying, take that feeder that goes out, as long as it's not a service conductor, take that feeder, the raceway that you're putting that conductor in, throw in a, a, a branch circuit for the receptacle, and he might have a point there. I don't believe there is anything... That way, whatever that feeder is, if you bring a brand circuit out with that feeder in the same raceway, I believe you have to have the same voltage levels. You've got to think about the voltage ratings of your conductors, et cetera, uh, in the same raceway. But that might be a solution, and you might be uh, – he, he's probably right. Um, so that might be a solution to be able to provide a receptacle. So there are ways to do that, so be mindful of that. All right, so Mark Rogers. <laughs> Mark Rogers, let's take a look at your question. Question on UL508A SB4. How would the SCCR rating be applicable to an electronically SCR switched capacitor system with reactors connected in parallel to a network be applicable? All right. And then you added some other stuff. BKG. Any internal fault would be less than 10K, but as a passive load, it's out of compliance with NEC 110 SCCR standards, primarily focused on industrial control for active and inductive loads feed. Externally sourced faults should have no additional contribution as only capacitive source. Also has 50K A OCPD, but not being considered. Exception one should apply for the entire system with the circuit breaker. Correct. Always enjoy your shows. Thanks, Mark. Well, you've got, you, you, you like, you know, you gave me both barrels on this one. So here's, uh, let's just talk about the short circuit current rating of an industrial control panel, say a UL508A type of application. What I would do is look at the current path 
through that industrial control panel. And I would look at every component, the terminal blocks, breakers, switches, anything that's going to carry power. And I have to look at what the rating is of that equipment, and then based upon what is protecting it. So it's a power flow perspective. And then I've got to make sure that uh, then what I do is I, I take the weakest link in all of this and determine and whatever the weakest link is, whatever the lowest rating is, that's the rating of my of my UL 508A panel. Now, what you're talking about is, and I wish I had, oh, Mark, can you send me? Do this. This is what I'm going to do. Send me a schematic. Send me a diagram. And here's what I will do. I'll, for me to answer this based upon a fourth order differential equation, I'm going to have to have that, that single line diagram. That will help me understand exactly the flows and what's there. And it will help me figure out the SCCR. And what I'll do is I'll go grab Dan Neeser, who's on 508. Hey, Dan, and, and I will do this. Oh, this is beautiful. Mark, this is beautiful. Can you, can you get me a diagram? Get me a diagram. And here's what I'll do. I will get... I'm going to get um, Dan Neeser and Joe Pavia. And what we'll do is a 508A program. And we'll use your one line as a method to do that. Now, if you, if you, let me know if you can get me that. If you have my email address, and you probably do. Hopefully you do. I'll put it in here. Thomas A. Dimitrovich at Eaton.com. Thomas A. Dimitrovich at Eaton.com. Send me that and because I would love to walk through it and 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 walk through the process of uh, determining the short circuit current rating of an industrial control panel based upon uh, IEEE or UL 508A and that supplement. So in any case, what you do is you look at every single component. Now you're thinking of, I believe you said capacitors. How would the SCCR rating be applicable to an electronically SCR switched capacitor system with reactors connected in parallel to a network? Those would be in the in the fault current path, right? So I would say, without seeing a one line, you have to follow the the the, the current the path the current will take through that system and make sure that every component has a, a, the right rating and if you have uh, if the scr is in series then you have to look at what the rating is of that equipment excellent let's do that that way that way i can that way because i i think your question can lead to a really good uh session around short circuit current ratings and how you determine short circuit current rings, and I'll tell you what we have. We have a program called OSCAR. It's not a hot dog, it's not an Oscar Meyer wiener. This, this little guy is called OSCAR, and um, Eaton O-S-C-A-R. Okay, exception one excludes capacitors, reactors, and solid state switches, which is all major components. So I think, though, Mark, you have to think about like a capacitor is not a series circuit, capacitors in parallel, right? And I believe, I believe when I do a when I do a short circuit current rating of a piece of equipment, my analysis is not for internal faults. My analysis is for that through fault.
So when I have an internal component that's in parallel, it's not going to see that fault current. There's no path for it. The path is through the equipment. That's where my gut's telling me, and probably why that exception exists. But a line reactor may, like if I have a reactor that's in series but not in parallel, then that reactor is in series with the circuit. I would have to account for that from a short circuit current rating. But if internally I attach something in parallel, my fault's going to pass through. It's not going to pass through that parallel circuit. It's my story, and I'm sticking to it, especially caps. So in any case, you get me that. I will get the experts, and we will have a session, and we will have a blast. Elizabeth Watson wants to pick my brain on 645. Yeah, send me a message via, via Facebook if you are. I don't know if you are watching or not. Excellent, Mark. Uh, so if you, if, if Elizabeth, if you can send me. I just saw a message come in on Facebook. Send me your question and we'll take a look at it. But so that's how I would I would address that. Now, let's talk about I've got uh, my last session. So I basically this is what I did with Mark. I'm I'm running down the field and uh and I'm pushing back. I got I got Mark at arm's length, okay? Cuz I'm like, "Oh, hold on, hold on. Smart guy, smart guy. Good question." We're going to get some experts in, and we're going to take a look at his one-line diagram or his uh, schematic, and we're going to walk through the process of determining a short-circuit current rating, and we're going to do it maybe not on Q&A Friday. Maybe we do it as a special session on Tech Tuesday or Thursday or something like that, but uh, you all will know about it. I will advertise it and let you know, but I'm going to get – I can hook Dan Neeser and Joe Pavia. You know, typically, if both of those individuals are in the same room at the same time, I don't know what, what would happen. I don't know if the, it's like the Earth would shatter or if the space-time continuum would, would something would happen. But um, two good brains in the same room might be dangerous. Let's talk about separately derived systems. When I have a generator, do I bond? The neutral in the generator and put a ground rod in do i do it in the transfer switch do i do it at the service does it matter and i'll show you i gotta show you what i uh what the question came in so here's what i'm gonna do because i did not diagram this out i'm gonna do a blank presentation my nose is actually getting better. See? Talking. So here's what I am going to do. I am going to try something here. I'm not going to do that. What am I going to do? I am I'm going to do this. All right. Um, there we go. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to draw, uh, I'm going to draw, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to, I, I do that all the time. Do you guys say I'm going to, or do you say I'm going to, I'm going to draw something. I'm going to, I'm going to draw something. I am going to draw something for all of you. This is what we have. I have a bus. So buses will be thick lines. Conductors will be skinny lines. So I'm going to make sure this is the thickest line I can get. There is a bus, and on that bus is a generator connected to the bus. Hey, Robert from Omaha. Teach that class, buddy. Thanks for what you do for electrical safety. Robert is teaching a class right now, and he is a rock star. So now, um, here's what we're going to do. I never said I was a good artist. So remember, off of, um, off of here, we have what? We have this. We have uh, ground, right? And one more. 
Okay, this is what we do there, and um, and and the voodoo that we do is green, and then control C V. Control C V. What do we do? We bond the generator enclosure to ground, right? Now, you don't have to. The code doesn't require you to put a ground rod out at the generator. Some people do. And that's perfectly fine. You are not required to do that. Not at all. And this will typically be a Y. Why? Because we love you. This will typically be a Y generator like this. And I, I tell you what, you if you are watching this right now, you are a saint. Okay, so I have um, I've got a Y, and I'm going to give it a white, so it shows up. So I have a generator, and it's connected to a bus. And actually, there were multiple generators, but we'll just say one generator. And I'll, and I'll show you the tricky part of this. So let's move this to about right here. And then I have a transformer. I use Inkscape to make this kind of sketch. Inkscape. I'll tell you what, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look up Inkscape. <sighs> But here on this technical social distancing network, this is how we draw a transformer. That is a transformer. So we have a transformer and then we have delta Y. Okay, so we have a transformer and we have a delta Y transformer. Control C V. And I need to make it black. There it is. All right, so the secondary of this transformer could work for you in the future absolutely i'm telling you what this guy this guy right here rock star you are a rock star you're giving me good ideas that is an absolute awesome thing so what do we do with this transformer we tie it to ground right now here is what was on this project i got this going on and then we're going to double this up control cv we're going to put another one over here. And I'll tell you. Hold on. There it is. So I've got a transformer. I've got a bus. On the secondary of this transformer is here, and I'm going to do two of these. There, and we're going to make it a feel. I know this is painful, isn't it? And what am I doing? I am drawing a. I'm drawing a transfer switch. Okay, so what you've got, what you've got here is failure to, to communicate. All right, so you're going to love this. This is, I'm going to call this the case. Now, obviously, there are breakers in here. I am not drawing the breakers because I am doing this on the fly. And I'm sniffling at the same time. Okay, so here we go. So here is what we got. I have two transfer switches. I've got a generator that is that has a ground rod. I've got a separately derived system, delta Y ground transformer here, a delta Y ground transformer there. Now, the question is, do I have to switch the neutral? If I create a bond up here, I bond that neutral. 
I'm going to create a little bond. James Bond. Okay. I bond that neutral. Clariton, I know. Here's the thing. No, you know what? Cla I, I, not Clariton. Here's what I use, and this is the only thing that works. Clariton doesn't work. Clariton D or whatever they call it does not work with me. The only thing that will work is those NyQuil pills. Not NyQuil. Tylenol nighttime. They're blue or green. But the problem with it is I space out and I want to go to sleep. So I need... Um, I need uh, uh, as much antihistamine as you can get. Intervenous antihistamine would be great. And after I do this program, I'm going to go get lunch. I have a 70B two-hour uh, review uh, session with my product guys. And we're going to be going over the code language. And if I took anything like that before that call, I would be out like a light, even though I'm the guy. So... Here's the thing. The question is, on these transfer switches, four pole or three pole, do I switch the neutral? Neti pots. I never tried one of those. Mark, that's a good, that is a good idea. Four pole or three pole? I need I need to know what do you think? What is why is a four pole uh, important? If I am bonded here, I have a separately derived system. If I have a separately derived system, then I have a neutral that is bonded to ground at this generator. If I have if I have a neutral that is bonded in this generator and the neutral is bonded to ground at this transformer and at this transformer, if I don't switch the neutral, then I am bonded through the equipment grounding conductor. Because remember, there is a I'm going to draw an equipment grounding conductor. And what we're going to do is we're going to make it green. And the equipment grounding conductor, because I want you all to see it, I'm going to give it some thickness here. So here we go. So this is my equipment grounding conductor, right? I am, I am, I am bonded from this panel, from the generator to that panel. I am bonded from this panel to the transfer switch, right? Because I'm, remember, the equipment grounding conductor, what does it do? It simply bonds all of the metal parts together. I am bonded to the enclosure of this transformer, which I didn't give it an enclosure, but I'm going to now. There is my enclosed transformer, right? And I am, uh, we're going to say it's a Y grounded, right? So uh, I'm going to move that over. I am bonding the windings and I am grounding it. And again, I am bonded. I bonded my neutral and I've bonded my equipment grounding conductor. I've bonded my grounding electrode conductor and I've grounded my grounded conductor. So if I only switch the neutral, or if I, if I only switch the hot conductors and I don't switch the neutral in that transfer switch, my neutral is bonded right here to ground. My neutral is bonded right here to ground. My neutral is also bonded over here. I could do the same daggone thing over here, right? So, so the question that I that came to me was, this is what they said. They said all we want to do is lift the bond right here. They are going to do this, lift that bond and not connect it to the generator. And they're going to say, well, 
this is no longer a separately derived system. So all I have to do is lift the bond in the generator, and now I can live with my three-pole generator, my three-pole transfer switches. But you can't do that. And the reason is, typically, if, if, if it was just the generator, one transfer switch, and a service, say that the, say the transfer switch was service entrance, say the, 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 the transfer switch was connected to your service panel board where there was bonded, you could get away with, say, I'm just going to uh, unbond the generator. But in a system this complex, even without, even with that bond lifted, you still have an, just look at this real quick. You've got this bonded, right? You have got this bonded. And you have this bonded. And you have this bonded to ground. So now I have two, even though I might... In a three pole, this neutral, I may not, I may be, I have a neutral conductor that is bonded at this secondary of the transformer and at this secondary of the transformer, and they are connected. They're both connected electrically. So I can't do that because those neutrals are connected. I need to switch the neutral in these transfer switches. And what that does is it completely separates. If I switch the neutral, I'm not connected at this point with that neutral conductor that's on this side because it's isolated from this system. If I switch this neutral, this is isolated. That whole portion is isolated from this system. The neutral is. If I don't switch that neutral, then that neutral conductor still has a reference point at each of those transformers. So you need a four-pole transformer. This was purposed in 214, demanded a, a... However, the CMP state 250.6 can be used to mitigate. 250.6. <clears throat> 250.6. Two fifty point six says objection. Oh, objectionable currents. Yeah, new language was added in two fifty point thirty. Last sentence has requirements for multiple SDS tied together. Two fifty point thirty. Yes. Grounding of separately derived systems. Yep, and there's the system bonding jumpers, there's supply side bonding jumpers, grounded conductors. So that's your reference. I agree with you, uh, L. 250.30 is your is your reference, and you could have circulating currents going on if you don't if you don't switch that neutral. But remember, this system is much more complicated. It's a it's a larger system, and it's much more complicated than. Um, than most other um, than most other systems that probably the more I would say frequent systems that we see. So uh, what 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 I've what I learned well so you know have I seen these before? Yeah, it, it, pretty rare. But but the question that came into me was, hey, can I just disconnect? the equipment grounding conductor from the neutral in the generator and still use a three-pole generator or a three-pole transfer switch. And when you look at it, it's like, no, you can't. You could, in, in some instances, that could be a very simple, easy fix. You don't need to go buy a four-pole transfer switch. I was on a job site with an electrical inspector, and we, uh, we, we went into the, um, we, we opened up the generator. I looked down in. We both can look down in. And there was the ground rod, and we followed that, and it was bonded to the neutral. So it was a separately derived system. 
Then we went into the uh, small building. It was a cell tower. We go into the small building, and there's a transfer switch, and it's a three-pole transfer switch. So we both immediately said, okay, well, that's a, that's an issue. And, and his comment, the inspector's comment was, boy, they're going to have to buy a four-pole transfer switch to fix this problem. And I said, no. All they got to do, that's right, Al, Kirchhoff's current law. I said, all they got to do is go into the generator and unbond it. So then what we did, and it was a Kohler generator. It was a Kohler generator. In fact, I might even have the pictures. It was a Kohler generator, and I'm going to see if I can find the pictures, because I, I know I have them. And um, we opened up the instructions for that generator and lo and behold they had specific here we go i found the pictures i think i did yes all right so that's not it here we go here we go here here we go all right so so this is down inside, and, and you can barely see it, but there's a, a ground rod driven, and I think that's it right there, if I'm not mistaken. So this is where we, um, where we found the, uh, I'm just looking at pictures here, so hold on. There's the generator. Give me a sec. But that's that's where it was grounded, right? And and it was bonded up inside the equipment. And I think that was the bonding strap right there, if I'm not mistaken. I'm almost positive that was the bonding strap because I was looking through the instruction book and that and it was pointing to that area. But the instruction book itself, there's some more bonding going on right there. And then we went into the transfer switch. So this was the ASCO transfer switch, and it did not switch the uh, the neutral. So we 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 said, well, we got a we have a problem there, and it was two, and it needed to be an extra. We needed to add a pole, but we didn't need to do that because it well, all we had to do was lift the. And those are just I gotta find. I thought I had. Oh, here, 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 here. There we go. So these were from the instruction book, right? So ungrounded neutral connections, bus bars, optional bus lugs. That's not it. There's the torque. I was, I was researching the torque. Grounding. There we go. Connecting. There's the equipment ground. Ungrounded, uninsulated for grounded lug selection. The four bus bars contain the optional bus bar kits, optional bus lugs. Generator sets are typically shipped from the factory with the neutral attached to the alternator in the junction box for safety reasons per 70. At installation, the neutral can remain grounded at the alternator or be lifted from the ground stud and isolated if the installation requires an ungrounded neutral connection at the generator set. The gener generator set will operate properly in either configuration. And then they go into the, so, and then there was a diagram showing um, how to lift that bond. So, so you, if you read the instructions on the generators, they'll tell you how to do that. Could an SDS also apply to a standalone PV systems, not R. Kelly. Um, so standalone PV systems, you got to look and say, are they separately derived or not? And I would argue, would you argue they are separately derived? Is that a separately derived system? You got to answer that question. Could a separately derived system also apply to a standalone PV system? And if it's a standalone system, 
No. I mean, it is a separately derived system. You need the ground, you need to do the bonding. So yes, it's a separately derived system. The real question comes into play when you have a, when you have like a um, inverter, right? So if I have an inverter on my, on my uh, PV system, the question is, is that inverter a separately derived system or not? And I think I would argue it's not a separately derived system. That is your SBJ, supply side bonding jumper. Do you still have a ground fault return path? Yes. You have a ground fault return path through the normal system because remember, you're grounded and bonded at the service. So if I had a, if I had a transfer switch, as an example, and I'm doing a three-pole transfer switch. My neutral is bonded at the service. I'm not bonded at the generator, but my neutral is bonded. And my equipment grounding conductors are all connected, and everything is bonded at the service. I do have a return current path. It may not... No system bonding jumper. No system bonding jumper. System bonding jumper. No system bonding jumper. Yeah, it's at the service. Everything is at the service. If you are bonded and you are you are bonded to the to the um, grounding electrode through the grounding electrode conductor, you have the neutral bonded there, you have your equipment grounding conductors all bonded there, everything's going to return back to that as your source. Now, you're going to say, well, your source is really the generator because you're on that transfer switch. That's fine, but you can only have one ground in the system. There's nothing in the code that says you have to have a four-pole transfer switch. There's nothing that's in the code that says it has to be wired as a separately derived system. The generator can be a separately derived system, or it can be non-separately derived system. It all is determined on how you bond at the generator. If you don't bond it, your separately derived system is still coming from the in the service equipment. That's where your bonding is done. As long as you only bond in one place, you're still good. That's what counts when you start lifting ground connections. No, I uh, was referring to, no, I mean system bonding jump. System bonding. System bonding jumper. So, I mean, you, you have to bond everything together. So let's take a look. You're saying bonding jumper, system bonding jumper, bonding jumper. Boop, 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 boop. So your system, the connection between the grounded circuit conductor and the supply side bonding jumper or the equipment grounding conductor, or both, at the separately derived system, right. So if my generator is not a separately derived system, where am I doing all of that bonding? In my service panel. As long as it's only done one place, I'm good to go. I can't do it twice. If I bond it at the generator, meaning I have my, I have to treat it like a separately derived system. I have to bond the ground, the equipment grounding conductor to the grounding electrode conductor to the neutral. All of that happens at the generator. I have my system bonding jumper, and that's the connection between the grounded circuit conductor, that's my neutral, and the supply side bonding jumper or the equipment grounding conductor or both at the separately derived system. So I would have my grounding electrode con my grounding electrode right there at the generator, and I'd have my grounding electrode conductor, and then I would bond my equipment grounding conductor, my grounded conductor, and my grounding electrode conductor all right there at the generator. Excellent. So that was the question that came in, but and in some cases I can lift that bond 
and be good with a three-pole generator or a three-pole transfer switch or a two-pole transfer switch and not switch the neutral. But if I have, like in this complicated system, I had two transformers, I had bonding and grounding, and those were two separately derived systems, I have to switch that neutral because I will violate to Al's point 250.30. I think he said, I think it was 250.30. Yep, 250.30. So that I and I think you know what that's a that is a really good it, it was a good it was a good question. And I could probably do a program, we could probably sit and talk about uh separately versus non-separately derived systems. Yeah, we are we are on the same page, you know. It's just a matter of semantics and is really hard when you're uh just looking at a chat. So in any case, it's one o'clock. Thank you for dialing in to Q&A Friday. I hope all of you have a lovely, safe weekend. I hope you enjoy your weekend, and, um, and I hope it, in, it treats you well. So thanks for joining in. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for the dialogue. And if you're watching this after the fact, comment on this video. Let me know. Are we talking about the right stuff? Do you like the Q&A Fridays? Do you like a technical program that's planned with slides? Do you like them both? Um, let me know how that all that goes. Don't forget to subscribe, please. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Check out the IAEI's YouTube channel as well. And also, um, I just started membership stuff. So uh, I will be putting videos up for probably members only. I'm doing separate sessions. For those of you who are, um, hey, Joe Bellantoni, thanks. For those of you who are members out there, my Tom Demet thomasdimitrovich.com or tdimitrovich.com. And when you have your gold membership over there, which is free, uh, I, I do some live streaming. Uh, thank you, Felix. Uh, but uh, also I'm putting that on my general YouTube channel, but I'm making that members only. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you want to watch those, uh, you can. And uh, we're, we're doing a 2020 code 2023 code change book. I will be working on a 70B book that you guys can help edit. And I will be working on a 70E changes book. So all three of those, we're going to be having a lot of, uh, a lot of dialogue in on those topics. And hopefully you uh, can join us and, and or at least participate and <laughs> and, uh, and and uh and contribute so thank you very much again mark thank you and yes i can't wait i can just uh I, when i get when i hit that when i hit this uh end button i am going to probably just explode <laughs> my nose is killing me again thanks for everything that you do for electrical safety thanks for what you do for the electrical industry and please remember Stay safe and please stay healthy until next week. See ya. Take care. See you next week.